that count count. Good morning and welcome to Family Life. We're so glad you're here with us in person and online. And I'll invite you now to stand as we begin to sing together. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging seas. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out Shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes the way. Because he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Amen. Amen.
child of God, that we lose sight of the true enormity of what that means, God. And I pray that as we continue to sing, that we will just resonate and really soak in the words, God, that you do, you do allow us the opportunity to see miracles and see faithfulness and see truth throughout our daily life, God. And I just, I just so, so heavy on my heart, God, to just, that we don't lose sight of that. It is such an incredible gift. And God, I just pray as we continue to sing these next few songs, God, that you will ignite just a true excitement, God, a re-excitement or a new excitement, whatever that might be for everyone in this room, God, that you will help us to truly sing and proclaim your name and your the miracles that you've done and the glory and the healing that you've done, God, throughout our lives, Jesus, and all through your word, Jesus. We thank you, God, that you gave us your son to 
Show us and be the example, God. God, let us not take it lightly, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The King is in the room. Come see the scars of love upon his hands. The King is in the room. We'll watch the darkness flee at his command.
in the streets Jesus in the darkness over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life wake up we ask you to begin to illuminate the darkness and the uncertainty that's in our hearts. We thank you that in the mighty name of Jesus, there is freedom, there is power, there is healing, there is restoration, there is wholeness, there is joy, there is peace, there is strength, encouragement, power. And so we pause in the middle of our time and in the middle of our day just to declare your name over our hearts and over our lives. That Jesus, it is all yours. That you are the only one that can move so mightily in our lives and so powerfully. And so we just declare your name, Jesus, over everything in our lives. Because when you are over everything, you do incredible things. So now we understand the gravity and the ramifications of singing such a song. Jesus over everything. And so I pray that we will give everything in our hearts to you. Speak to us. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see fresh, hearts that are open, and feet to walk out the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Family Life, whether you're here in person or online. We're so glad that you decided to be part of our service today, and you made it, right? I always love uh, Time Change Sunday, uh, especially those that maybe just walked in in the last 37 seconds or so. I, I don't know if you actually did or not, but, uh, you know, it's always fun, like, oh, yeah, it's already 10. That's nice. Uh, but we are so glad that you are here today. If you could take a moment and fill out that connection card if you're here in person, it's located right there in the seat in front of you. That's a great way to let us know you're here. Also on the back of that, there is a place for you to fill out any uh, prayer requests or praise reports that we could be praying with you or celebrating uh, with you. So take a moment and do that. We look through those every week uh, and pray over those every week. And so make sure you take a moment and, and fill those out. If you're online, you can use the digital connection card. You can also use uh, the Family Life Church app that is available from any app store. Uh, everything that we have going on at Family Life uh, and connecting to our app, to our website, to give, everything can use that QR code uh, that's directly behind me and you're able to uh, scan that with your, with your mobile device and you're able to uh, connect different ways with Family Life there. Uh, and that really is the easiest way to stay connected at Family Life is through our, our app and through the uh, website. So make sure you take a moment and you do that today. If you would like to give, you can do so. Uh, you can use the giving envelope if you're in person. You can drop that in the uh, black box as you head out. Uh, there's another one in the lobby as well. And uh, you can also give online at flachurch.org or through the uh, app as well. If you're new to Family Life, I want to say thank you for being here. We're so glad that you decided to spend your uh, morning with us. And if you could do us one favor as you leave today, if you could take your connection card across the lobby to the hub, uh, there's going to be someone there just to thank you for coming uh, and get to know you a little bit, say hi. Uh, but there's also a free gift for you as well. So make sure you take a moment if you are, are new uh, to Family Life and, and you just swing over there and say hi. Well, you might go into the lobby uh, and when you came in, you might have saw a bunch of different things up that aren't normally up there. Uh, one is we had students, uh, middle school and high school students, uh, that participated in the Northwest Ministry Network's Fine Arts Festival. And so that happens uh, once a year, and it's an opportunity for students to uh, use the gifts and talents that they have uh, to share Jesus. And, and it helps them realize that, you know what, I might not be a singer, or I might not be a preacher, or I might not be a teacher, 
but man, I have some wicked awesome photography skills. So let's use those, you know, or I can draw and it's amazing. I can do that. Or I can write poetry. There's all these different skills and talents that people have. And the, the fine arts festival is an opportunity for them to find out what they're good at and then use those gifts uh, to share Jesus with people. And so I encourage you to go out there. There's a bunch of different photography and some drawings and some uh, poems and different things, uh, but we had a few students go and participate that uh, this week, and I, I think at one point you might see, I don't know, there might be pie out there, I don't know what's all happening, but uh, how many nerds are in the house today? You're just a, you're a bona fide nerd, you, you have no problem saying it, good, there's a few of us. Uh, pie day is coming up, if you don't know what pie day is, don't worry about it, okay? If you can't put it together, um, you're probably, we're in the back of mathematics class with me, uh, but my wife is a nerd, and I say that in the most loving and respectful way possible. Like, she will fully embrace that, uh, that category. Uh, but the kids are celebrating Pi Day. It's coming up, uh, and you'll figure it out. Google it if you have to. But, you know, we're, we're all good there. Uh, so, we are in the fourth week of our series, How to Love People. And we have been looking at the Ten Commandments. And, and this started uh, a while ago with a series on how to love God. And when you look at the Ten Commandments, there are the first four which are all about how to love God. They're our relationship to God. And then the, the remaining six are all our relationship to people. And what we begin to, to find and what we begin to discover is that God gave the Israelites these 10 commandments so that they remembered and learned how to be God's people in God's land, living on God's mission. That, that is the whole reason we have them because God had promised Abraham generations before that he would be this great nation. And he was old, right? He was not in childbearing years, neither was his wife, but yet they had a son. And that son and the promise to be a great nation, a father of, of many, descendants as numerous as the stars, that, gen, that promise got passed down generation to generation, and then eventually they end up in slavery in, Israel, in, in, in Egypt. 400 years, they're slaves. And so they are finally set free. Moses leads them out through the hand of God, uh, setting them free. Moses leads them, and so God says, okay, you've been in slavery, you've still remembered me, but guess what? We need to learn how to be my people, living in the land I'm giving you, and on the mission that I have. And we do the same as we look at these Ten Commandments. And so here they are, in case you don't know them, or in case you need a refresher. Uh, number one is do not have any gods before me, all right? Number two, do not make any idols or bow down and worship them. Number three was do not use God's name in vain. Number four was remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Number five was honor your father and mother. Number six, you must not murder. Number seven, you must not commit adultery. And today we're looking at number eight, you must not steal. And that is what Exodus chapter 20 verse 15 tells us. You must not steal. Now, I think for the majority of us, we dismiss this command, all right? That like we, 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 we in a way, we think, okay, that's one that, that you know, we kind of universally uh, uh, kind of agree on that you shouldn't do that. And uh, the Bible, both Old and New Testament, speak clearly that that is wrong, that it's sin, that you shouldn't do it. And, and so we, a lot of times we look at this command, we're like, you know, don't steal. And we think we need to tell our kids this one, right? That like, that's, that's, that's for the kids, right? Let's move on to the next one. Uh, but really, when you begin to think about this, you must not steal, we have some generalizations as to what stealing looks like. Now, when we think about it, we think car prowlers, you know, cutting off your catalytic converter underneath your car in the middle of the night. You know, we think of uh, someone breaking into your house and stealing things. Uh, we think of shoplifting. You know, we, we have kind of the, you know, you just see it on the side of the road, you're like, I'll take it. Uh, you know, and, and so we have that kind of generalization when it comes to stealing, and, and we have a very, in a way, a very specific box that we look at when it comes to this. But what Jesus has done with these commands and, and what we have discovered is that Jesus said, I haven't come to abolish or get rid of the law, but I've come to fulfill it. And the way that he fulfills it is by increasing the expectation. Now, he doesn't increase it in a legalistic way. It's not like he says you must not steal and then he gives you even more and more and more rules. What Jesus does with the commands is he gets into our hearts. He takes the physical act, you must not steal, 
and says, let's bring that even farther in. Because what happens and what we know is this, and we looked at it, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. That everything that we do, everything that we say, comes from our heart. And that's where we run into trouble oftentimes. Is that Jesus wants to get to the heart of this command. Now, when you think about the Israelites, it's, it's, and God giving this command, it's a pretty challenging command. And it's challenging because, one, they've been in slavery. So they know what it's like to have their freedoms taken. But then when you're in slavery, you might actually do some things and steal some things from someone else because you don't have it. And so as they are set free, they are now roaming throughout the wilderness, throughout the desert. Alan R. Cole, who's an author and a commentator, he wrote this, In a peasant society where life is hard, any theft of property may lead to death. So it's a very serious crime. So when you look at the Old Testament and they talk about stealing, it's punishable by death. The reason it's punishable by death is because in your theft, chances are you would end up killing someone else. So if I only have one water jar and you steal it, what do I have to do? We're in the wilderness. We're in the desert. It's not like water is a commodity. And so I've, it's only a matter of time, right? Or if I take your food, or if I take your animal, if I take your tent, all of a sudden you begin to realize that when you begin to steal some of these things, it's going to lead to death. It's going to lead to challenge. And so most of the time in the, Old, in the Old Testament, this commandment is given to us in such a way uh, that it, it leads to to your death if you choose to do it. Now, here's what's interesting about Jesus. Jesus, again, he's getting at the heart of the command. He affirms the commands. But then he says something incredibly interesting in John 10.10. 10. Because in John, uh, you, you know that he says uh, in the Old Testament, you steal, it's death. And so here's what Jesus says, though. John 10.10, 10, he says that the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. It's interesting when he says that because oftentimes we confuse sometimes theft and God and goodness because this is the challenge that we have. When we steal, we fail to recognize who God is. Now, when we do this, we, we, we fail to see that Jesus clearly says, the enemy, the devil, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give life. And the reason that we might steal, getting to our hearts, is because we don't recognize, fully recognize God's goodness. We don't fully trust his provision. We don't fully believe that Jesus is able to do what he says he can do. And so what we do is we end up going and stealing something that we think we need or that we believe we need, and we begin to believe that that is going to provide for us more than God will. That all of a sudden, when you go back to don't make any idols, the things we think we need can quickly become idols. And here's the challenge that we have in this, is that it becomes very easy for us, and maybe you find yourself in this season right now where you think God is withholding his goodness from you. You ever found yourself there? That maybe you are sitting there and maybe it is a financial situation, maybe it's a health situation, maybe it's an addiction situation, maybe it's in relationships, and you're going, God, I'm doing everything right. I am showing up, I'm serving, I'm giving. Like, why don't you give me what I want? Why don't you give me what I need? Like, why are you not good? And we can quickly find ourselves looking at God and saying, God, you are withholding good things from me. I'm holding up my end of the deal. You're not. And so because you're not, I'm going to go find something that will. Here's the challenge. We do not have the same thoughts or ways that God does. And the Old Testament says that God says, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, so why are you even trying to think in the same way that I do? <laughs> because here's what we forget sometimes. What we forget in the challenges and in the seasons where we're like, God, why are you withholding your goodness from me? The, probably one of the main reasons that you are not seeing that 
is because if God gave it to you right now, you wouldn't know what to do with it. That if God took care of every financial issue that you ever had, you would think, oh my goodness, my life would be so much easier. I could take care of the bills. I could t- pay this off. I could get rid of this debt. I'd be able to give more. I'd be able to bless other people. I'd be able to be generous. And so often we think if I just had more, I would then do something different than with what I have right now. And so God doesn't give us sometimes the things that we think we need because he wants us to walk through some things to change our heart so that our actions reflect the heart that's changed on the inside. And so we look at this and we say, God, where, like, it, it, when, 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 when we steal, when we take, we fail to recognize God's goodness in that. We end up being more like the thief who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and less like Jesus who's come to give us life. And so we have to begin to think about this and, and, and how this works in our hearts and in our lives, and how does this idea of stealing, do not steal, how does this relate to loving people, right? Because at the end of the day, these Ten Commandments, they're how to love God and how to love people. And the first step in, in how, uh, having to love people is recognizing that God is still good, that God is faithful, that God is with you, that he's going to provide for you, that when you live and honor him, even when it is hard, he'll take care of you, he'll be with you, he'll provide, sometimes in ways that you don't think, sometimes in ways you might not want, but it's in his timing and his ways. But how do we begin to practically love people. And here's thought number one is this. We love people when we don't steal joy. Okay? There's two parts to this. The first part of this thought is don't steal your own joy. Now, you might not have heard it that way. You've probably heard it say, like, don't let the devil steal your joy. You've probably heard it said, like, don't let other people steal your joy. Don't let you steal your own joy. Here's how we do this. How many of you have a social media account? God bless social media. <laughs> you get on there, and do you ever notice that when you get on social media, very rarely are you in a good mood? Very rarely are you like, I am so excited just to scroll through the photos. Look at all of the things that ever, and so you get on there and you're like, man, it's not like that. The reason you jump on social media is because you do not want to think. Your brain is on overload, your emotions are gone, and you're like, you know what? I am just going to do something mind-numbing, and I'm going to scroll through this, and I'm not going to deal with it, and that's the reason some of you post things you shouldn't. So you get on there, and you see, oh, so-and-so's on vacation again. Do they ever work? (laughs) Oh, what do you know? Those kids are perfect again. (laughs) Oh, there's another party I wasn't invited to. (laughs) And all of a sudden, you begin to look at this, and you compare everything, all of it. And then you even do it in real life, too. Because you compare yourself to the neighbors. You compare yourself to coworkers. You compare yourself to people that you think you should be higher in the, in the org chart than they are. And you begin to compare and you can say, why, why can't I have good things? Why can't I do these things? And what you end up doing in comparison is you end up stealing all of the joy that you have. That you are comparing everything about everybody else and going, why is their life always better than mine? And we even do it in church. Why is God answering their prayers? Why is God working in their life and not mine? What is God? And we begin to compare everything to everyone else. It was Teddy Roosevelt that said, comparison is the thief of joy. Amen. That you begin to compare everything And what happens when you compare is you end up stealing your own joy. And then you're going, God, why am I not happy? Why don't I have joy? Why do I not have any peace? Because you are comparing your behind the scenes to everybody else's highlights. You are sitting there going, 
my life is so messed up. I don't have this. I don't have the relationship. I don't have the marriage they do. I don't have the vacations they do. I don't have the money they do. I don't have the kids they do. I don't have the job they do. And you are comparing everything that you see wrong with your life to the highlights. Because let's be honest, no one posts, I had a terrible day unless they want some attention. So we compare the highlights and the digital image that we want to portray, we compare that with our mistakes and our failures and our inadequacies, and then we wonder why we don't have joy. Stop comparing yourself to someone else. God has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for your life. And you might be sitting here going, I don't know what it is. Great. Awesome. Let me help. Love Jesus and love people and we'll figure it out from there. Like if you just do those two things really well, it will take care of itself from there. But we have to learn to stop comparing ourselves to other people. Now, I was in Houston this week at a conference and there are times when you're sitting there as a pastor and you're letting what you're about to speak on eventually kind of sit there and ruminate with you and, and you're kind of thinking about it and you're like, if you ever were on my phone and you looked in my notes section, there is just a hundred different notes of like, oh, this might be a good idea one day for a sermon or here's some other, you know, things. And so I'm sitting there and uh, Darius Daniels, who's a pastor in Atlanta, he's preaching and he, he starts talking and I'm like, you know, I'm going to steal this because it makes more sense than what I was going to say. Now, I'm not stealing it because I'm giving him credit. See the difference there? It's not plagiarism. It's his thought, and I think you need to hear it, all right? So I'll get to the point where it's his thought, the setup, it's a blend of the two. But when you begin to think about comparison, there's a great example of how damaging it is in Numbers chapter 13. If you have ever read the book of Numbers, which if, you are, have ever, if you've never read the Bible through, you generally just skip over it because you're like, why do we want to read about a bunch of numbers? I get it. Here's what happens. The Israelites have been set free from slavery in Egypt. God has given them the Ten Commandments, and they have uh, been wandering around the desert, the wilderness, trying to get to the land that God has promised them. And so they are on the doorstep of Canaan, the place that God is giving, the land flowing with milk and honey. Whenever you read in the Old Testament about the land flowing with milk and honey, this is what they're talking about. And so they are on the doorstep of this. And so Moses, what he does, he takes the 12 tribes of Israel and he says, give me one guy. And he takes one guy from each tribe and he sends them in as spies. Go check it out. And so these guys, they go into Canaan and they check everything out and they come back and everybody gathers around and they're like, what'd you see? Was it good? Was it flowing with milk and honey? Was there literally milk in a river and like honey? Like explain this for them. Like they're all gathered around. And these guys go, it was awesome. And they're like, look at this fruit. And they've got fruit as big as they, as they are. And they're like, yes, it's flowing with milk and honey. It's good. It's got everything you can want, the gardens and the food. And it's, it's incredible. And so one guy named Caleb says, all right, let's go. Let's go take it. And one other guy, did you ever be in a moment where you're, you think everybody's going to be in agreement with you, so you enthusiastically say yes. Caleb's like, let's go! And Joshua's like, yeah! And these two guys are the only ones that said yes. The other ten spies are like, no. Those people are going to kill us. They have, we have no hope of beating those guys. They are huge. They are giants. Their cities are huge and fortified. But when you read in Numbers chapter 1, God tells Moses, or Numbers 13 verse 1, God tells Moses, send scouts into the land that I am going to give you. God had already given them the land. All they needed to do was go take it. That's all they needed to do. It's like when you realize that like all you have, like, man, DoorDash and all those, like they've made things so easy. Like, remember when you've had to fight, like, when you were, maybe it was when you were first married, maybe it could still be, I don't know. But you're like, do we really, you didn't want to make dinner, and you're like, do we really want to go somewhere? 
right? And you have that like, I don't want to cook, you don't want to cook, I don't want to go sit somewhere, but I don't want to eat fast food. You go through that whole dilemma. Like, all you got to do is go get it, and then they had DoorDash, and it just brings it right to you, right? You're like, yes. I don't have to cook. I don't have to go where. It's awesome. God's literally door dashing them the promised land. He's like, I'm giving it to you. It is yours. It's right here. And look what they say in verse 33. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. He was a giant, huge We saw the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So here's what happens in the rest of the story. They don't go into the promised land. They don't decide to attack it. And they sit there and they cower and they fear. And here's what happens after this. Because of their disobedience, because they chose not to go in and take the land that God had already given them, God says, listen, none of you are except for Caleb and Joshua from this generation are going in. And for 40 years, they have to wander around the wilderness until a generation who didn't believe God and didn't view God in the way that they were supposed to died off so the next generation could come and do what God had already told them to do. And this was the statement that Darius Daniels made that I need you to hear as well. The Israelites did not lose to the giants in the land, but the grasshoppers in their head. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and to them. When you compare your role, your race, your life to someone else, God has already given you a plan. He has a purpose for your life. He has a destiny for you. And you might not know what it is, and that's okay. We can help you get there. But if you don't stay in your lane and run your race, and you're always looking at someone else's life instead of Jesus and keeping your eyes on him, you are going to find yourself going, I'm just a grasshopper. I'm just too small. I'm not significant enough. I, my, my purpose isn't big enough. I don't have enough. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough resources. My relationships aren't good enough. My marriage is messed up. My kid, like, all of a sudden, you begin to compare everything else, and you don't go into the land. You don't go to the promise that God has given you because you look like a grasshopper in your own eyes. You have to realize that Jesus is calling you to live out and be the person that he has created you to be. That he has given you the old life, as it says, as Paul wrote, the old life is gone, the new life has come. You have a new life to live. That the moment you said yes to Jesus, whether that was five minutes ago or 50 years ago or somewhere in between or even longer than that, when you said yes to Jesus and chose to follow him, he began to make your life new. And if you keep your head looking and comparing to everybody else, You will never get to the place God has for you. Run your race. Keep your head down. Keep your eyes on Jesus and stop comparing your life to someone else because if you don't, it will steal your joy over and over and over again. So how do we stop that? How do we prevent ourselves from stealing our own joy and how do we not steal the joy of others? And the way that we do that is this, is by celebrating other people. You have to celebrate some people. Look at what Paul wrote to Philippians and, and to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 2. He says this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I really like me. (laughs) We all really like a lot of me. And you know what happens in the next verse after this? It says, but you should have the same attitude as Christ, who humbled himself in thinking the throne of God and of heaven as nothing and descended to the earth to die a criminal's death on a cross to give his life as a ransom, all of a sudden you begin to see that Jesus gave everything. Instead of taking, he gave everything. 
And so the way that we begin to make sure that we aren't stealing our own joy and the way that we aren't stealing others is by learning to celebrate people. You know, one of the things that we do on, uh, during our staff meetings here at Family Life, we do it during our board meetings, is we take time at the very beginning and we celebrate wins. And so on our, our staff meetings, which are weekly, I go, all right, what's wins from the weekend? And these wins can be incredible things and really minor things. Like we can say, oh yeah, someone said yes to Jesus this week and we celebrate that. Or we can say, oh, you should hear what the kids did this. Or or we had volunteers here that were first-time volunteers and we had a first-time giver. Or we had someone that really just knocked it out of the park. Or the internet worked. Like there can be all these different things that can be really big and really small. But we celebrate it. And here's the challenge with celebrating. Is that sometimes you're not winning. It's a conversation we've had to have with our, on our team because there's sometimes that as we have different people leading in different areas, there's times in the, the life cycle of, of the seasons and the rhythms that they just don't feel like their ministry is winning. And in those seasons, we have to remind each other that we are on the same team, that it is not about one ministry, it is not about one place, but it is about the family of God, it is about Family Life Church reaching the community, creating spaces for people to experience Jesus and follow him. It is about all of us, and so we celebrate the wins and we stand next to each other when we struggle. It's the challenge that we have, though. Because here's the second part of the challenge of celebrating others is one, sometimes we're not winning, but two, sometimes God does things in people's lives, and we don't like the way that it happened. I don't like the way that God used that moment or that thing or that person. I wouldn't done it like, I don't prefer it that way. And I think God looks at us and goes, oh, thank you for your opinion. I'll let you know if I need your advice because I think I've got it under control. It's like when your kids tell you how to cook. My daughter loves pancakes, her favorite food on the earth. And if you don't cook it right, she will let you know. We've had to talk about it. If you don't like the way it's gotten cooked, cook it yourself. Here's the challenge with that when it comes to following Jesus is that you cannot cook Jesus into someone else's life. And so you can either celebrate what Jesus is doing or you can sit there and judge and be bitter and not celebrate it and steal your joy and theirs. We have to celebrate others. We have to celebrate what God is doing in their lives. We have to celebrate the ways that he is changing them. And we cannot hold it to our own ways and the ways that we think it should be done. We celebrate whenever God wins. If you don't want to steal someone's joy, celebrate them. If you don't want to steal your own joy, stop comparing yourself to other people. Recognize who God is. He is good, he is faithful, he is a provider, he is a protector, he is everything you need. And when you recognize who God is, it allows you to sit in the uncomfortable moments to get the things that you eventually need because God knows exactly what you need. And if you don't want to, if you want to love people, don't steal their joy, don't steal your own. But then here comes the second piece of how do we love people? We love people when we live on the mission with Jesus. We love people when we live on the mission with Jesus. Think about this, we are running into Easter very, very soon. And hopefully this next Sunday that you, we are gonna have some invite cards that are gonna be available to you that you're gonna be able to take and you're gonna be able to invite friends, family, all of that, it's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have our, our, our service, we're gonna have an Easter egg hunt after, it's gonna be great, you're gonna love it. And we celebrate Jesus in the whole thing, that's the best part. But after his death and resurrection, Jesus shows up to his disciples a few different times and one of the last times that he shows up to him, he says this, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And if you've grown up in church, you become very familiar with this passage. And so I pray that you have eyes to see, ears to hear, uh, see it new, ears to hear it in a new way, a heart that is open, and feet to walk out the truth, because here's what it says. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach 
teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, and surely I will, am with you always to the very end of the age. This is not a directive of the church. This is a directive of the people of God. That when we as individuals fail to make disciples, we are in a way failing to follow Jesus in obedience. When we fail to live on the mission with Jesus and not make disciples, we fail in following Jesus. And someone else will say, well, it's the church's job. No. What does Paul says the church's job? Ephesians chapter 4. Gives apostles, pastors, teachers to equip the saints for ministry. To equip for you to make disciples. This is a collaborative effort. And if we are going to love people, it requires us to make disciples. It requires us to live on the mission with Jesus. Making disciples is not optional. It's commanded. It's required. I mentioned I was down in Houston this last week. We got back really late. I think I got in bed at about 12, 12, 15. The alarm went off really quick. I didn't sleep well down there. I don't, like how many of you, like you'll go places but you don't sleep good when you're there? That's me. Like I love my bed. It is fantastic. I've got my one little section in it. Like as soon as I find that spot, like done. I'm not waking up. And so I'm, I'm tired. The alarm goes off. I got to get Bennett to school. He's in middle school now, so it's a little earlier than elementary school, which I love, 9 o'clock elementary school. Jesus, thank you. <laughs> so I get up. And have you ever woken up and you're like, I don't feel like adulting today. And I don't feel like peopling. And all I feel like is coffeeing. That's where I'm at. I'm literally one foot in front of the other. And so I get Bennett to school, and I go to Starbucks, which I know is a sin for some of you. Forgive me. Like, they just make it too easy. And I'm getting out of my car. There's this lady that just looks rough. And she's standing by the door, and she is mumbling to herself, and I'm like, okay. Somebody has a a little harder day than I am. So I like walk around, go inside. I get my coffee. And I'm on the way out. And I can feel the Holy Spirit going, do, 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 do. I'm like, not today, Jesus. <laughs> nope. Not today. Normally I say, no, not today, devil, not today. Today it was Jesus, not today. And he's like, you sure? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm very sure. All I want to do is drink this coffee because I have no idea what this lady is going to say. I have no idea how long it's going to take. I've done it before, and there are times I'm like, I do not have the time or the energy or the effort or the resources to connect you to whoever can help. I get to the door, and he's like, hey, remember, like, creating spaces for people to experience Jesus and follow him. I heard it. I say it all the time. I know what the mission is, Jesus. And I'm walking right on by, right to my car. And I start the car, and he's like, really? I'm like, yes. It is not happening today. And I drove off. I'll tell you this, pastors mess up too. We do. Pastors mess up too. I don't know if that conversation with that lady is going to take five minutes, five seconds, five years. I don't know. I don't know if she needed anything. I don't know if she was just in a really bad spot or she had mental, I don't know anything about her. I don't know what happened after I left. I don't know anything. I stole her moment to experience Jesus and follow him because I hadn't created enough space in my own life and in my own emotions and in my own time to stop. When we fail to create the space in our lives. We steal from people. We steal the opportunity for their life 
to be changed. We steal the opportunity for them to have a healing and restoration and wholeness. We have to live Matthew 28, 19 through 20. And I understand I will make mistakes just like you will. But we have to realize that every time we fail at it, we rob someone else. All I know is that Jesus wanted me to make enough space to use me in a moment to help someone experience Jesus. And it might have just been, hey, are you okay? Oh, yeah, I'm fine. Awesome. Might have been, are you okay? No, I'm not. And I want us to understand the gravity of this for a moment. Our entire faith is predicated on the resurrection of someone who was dead. That's a pretty big thing. That's not an everyday occurrence. Like, we don't see that happening very often. And too often, we look at people and think to ourselves, they're too far. What difference can I make? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to help. And Jesus, the one that was raised from the dead, whose spirit is living in us, he can do anything he wants to. He does not need you. He does not need me. But, he invites you to be on his mission so that he can use you to help someone experience Jesus and follow him. And like I shared at our team meeting this morning, we don't get to write the end of someone's story. All we get to do is take the pen and the paper and go, Jesus, you get to write it. How do you want me to use this today? How do you want me to use this moment? How do you want me to use this time? Because you're going to write the story. And I don't know, maybe that lady, if she's not a follower of Jesus, maybe if that moment that I would have stopped, we would have found out that she's this amazing, becomes this amazing follower of Jesus that leads hundreds or thousands of people to Jesus. Who knows what could have happened? Who knows what her story is? Who knows what happened to her life? But because I didn't create the space, we never know. We can't rob people of experience Jesus. We can't steal away moments of people experiencing Jesus because we don't create the space. So God, forgive us when we don't. Forgive us when we ignore. Forgive us when we say, not today, Jesus. Not today. We have to realize that we are invited to be on the mission with Jesus, to help heal the world, to help people experience Jesus and follow him. And it requires us to create the space to do so. I love what Paul writes in Romans chapter 13. He says this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. We are called to love people. It's really hard to say I love Jesus and not love people. It's contradictory. It's complete opposites. Because I cannot love God and then not love people. We have to do both. And part of that is not stealing, recognizing that God is my provider, he is my strength, he is all that I need, and I recognize that God will give me what I need in the time and in the right moment that I need it. But then at the same time going, I'm not going to steal my own joy by comparing it to someone else. I'm just going to love people. When I see that someone is succeeding, I'm going to say, that is so awesome. That is great that they're on vacation. That is great that their marriage is doing well. That is great that their kids are at that party. That's great. That I'm just going to celebrate it. And the reason I'm going to celebrate it 
is because I love people. Because I love Jesus, I love people. The way that I fulfill my love for God, the obligation that I have to the law is the way I love people. So I'm not going to steal joy. And I'm also not going to steal people's opportunities from experiencing Jesus. I'm going to love people by being on the mission with Jesus everywhere I go. And will you make mistakes? Absolutely you will. Will I make mistakes? Absolutely. But you know what? Jesus always gives you a second chance. And you know what it is? It's an opportunity to do the right thing again. And as you put together the right things, all of a sudden it builds. And you're going, this becomes so easy. And all of a sudden, people are going to be like, hey, why were you late? Like, I thought we were going to meet at 11.15. Well, let me tell you a story. Oh, man, I did not know. That's cool that God used you in that moment. And pretty soon, because you're always aware of what God is doing, and you're always listening, you're always obeying, people are going to be like, you know, I, I know we said 11.30. Let's just... 11.30-ish. Because it seems wherever you go, God's moving. Because you're willing to love God and love people. And you're willing to create the space so that you don't steal those moments from people. So here's our action point today. Live to give. Live to give. That if stealing is this idea of trying to get as much as you can with the least amount of effort, if stealing is trying to take as much as you can while well, getting and, and, and it costing you the least, Jesus flips it upside down. Jesus says, let's live to give. Because what did Jesus do? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He gave everything so that what? We could live. His death and resurrection and giving everything was for you to have life and then you know what Jesus says to his followers it's really really hard and I don't like it Luke chapter 9 verse 23 if any of you wants to be my followers you must deny yourself daily pick up your cross and follow me if you want to hang on to your life you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. What good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? As followers of Jesus that love people in the way of Jesus, we live because of Christ's death and resurrection, and we live to be like Jesus, which is willing to give everything. So how do you need to live to give today? How do you need to invite Jesus to direct your heart to love people better? How do you need to maybe stop stealing? Maybe it's physically like just stop stealing things. Stop. Like, don't do it anymore. But maybe you need a different view of God. Maybe you need to stop comparing yourself. Maybe you need to start celebrating others. Maybe you need to get on the mission with Jesus and create the space in your heart so that you can celebrate and see what Jesus wants to do. How are you going to live to give? Will you stand with me this morning? As we think about that question in our hearts and in our lives, I know we don't always think, I, I, you probably came in today and you're like, okay, we're talking about number eight, that's stealing, not really my deal. Don't really struggle with that one. And if you do, that's okay. Jesus can work on your heart, change your life. And if you say, oh, it's not me, I bet Jesus wanted to expand a little bit of your definition today. And in doing so, he's going to enable you to love people way better. And so I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. And, and, and as I do, maybe you're struggling with the comparison game. Maybe you're just questioning, God, where is your goodness in my life? Like, I'm doing all the things you want me to do. I'm checking all the boxes. I'm following the eye, dotting the eyes, crossing the I'm doing everything you want. Where are you at? God goes, I'm right here. Maybe for you today, you need, just need to recognize God's goodness and his grace in your life. You need to see that he's good, that he's going to provide for you, that he's going to take care of you. That as you continue to honor him, he will take care of you. 
But maybe you've been looking around, you got your head up, and your eyes are going, what about that? They got, stop. Jesus has a plan and a purpose and a mission for your life. Just get in your lane and stay there. Maybe you just need to celebrate someone else. Maybe even this weekend, you had someone call you and say, hey, this is so cool, this is what happened. And you're like, yeah. And the inside, it just ripped you apart because you didn't get what you wanted because it hadn't taken care of the way. You're, you're not being taken, and you couldn't even celebrate that person. Don't steal their joy. Don't steal your own joy. Maybe you're like me. <laughs> not today, Jesus. Not today. But asking Jesus, give us a second chance. Give us another chance at creating space for people to experience you and follow you. Because it's not just a mission for our church, it's a mission for us as individuals. It's how we communicate Matthew 28, 19 through 20. So where do you need to maybe stop stealing? And where do you need to live to give? So as I pray, will you pray for that as well? Let's pray that Jesus speaks to our hearts and speaks to our lives and begins to change us and lets us be secure in who he's creating us to be and being obedient to all the things that he asks. So Jesus, I thank you that you are here, that you are with us. I thank you that you speak to our hearts and to our lives. God, I pray that today you help us to see your goodness. You help us to see your grace. You help us to see that you are our provider, our protector, our healer, our restorer. You are all that we need. And so I pray for those that are maybe wrestling with how they view you, questioning if you're listening or paying attention or that why are you withholding good things from them. I pray that they will begin to seek after you and ask, God, when it's your time, when it's the right moment, give me what my heart's desire is, but until then, help me to be obedient in all that you're leading me to. Help me to still say that you're good. Help me to still say that you're faithful. Help me to still say that you're trustworthy. God, for those of us that have been walking around comparing everything else, we can't go a minute or a day without just looking at someone else and going, God, why are they always winning and I'm always losing? I pray that you'll help us to see the value that you have created in us. I pray that you will help us to see that you have called each one of us to a plan and a purpose and that when we look to you and we keep our eyes on you, we stay in our lane and we keep running towards you, you do incredible things in our hearts and in our lives. So help us not to compare ourselves to others or what you're doing in others, but help us to focus on you and know that we are more than enough as we follow you. God, help us to celebrate other people. Help us to maybe go back where we failed to celebrate and celebrate with someone. Help us to, the next moment, the next opportunity, we always be looking for the wins that you are doing in people's hearts and lives and we celebrate it even when it sometimes is difficult for us because we want to give joy and not steal it. And God, help us to live on the mission with you when you give us opportunities and you begin to prod our hearts and your Holy Spirit begins to lead us, help us to be obedient in that. And when we're not, forgive us. Forgive me. And help us to live on the mission with you because you want to use us to create spaces for you to fill that space with all that you are so that others can experience you and follow you. And so I pray that we will live and not steal those moments away from people. Help us to live to give in all that we do. Help us to turn to you in all things. Help us not to steal. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for being here. I'll be up here to pray with you. Uh, if you'd like prayer, I want to encourage you. Uh, come back next week. Invite someone to join you. And as we have started saying over the last few weeks, live sent. Jesus is sending you out. Go on his mission. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.